Who ever heard of a girl proposing to a guy? My goodness gracious. Well, that's exactly what Ruth did in those days. And you know what? According to the law and according to the situation, it was permissible. It was permissible. Indeed, but in this proposal, there are some very interesting things that happened. Things that I think benefit us as we look at the character of Ruth and of Boaz, her to be husband. So we want to look at that this morning. First of all, Naomi, as it started off, you know, is thinking about their situation. They're back in Bethlehem. You know, they came back from Moab. Remember, they came back empty. That is, Naomi came back empty. No sons, no husband. You know, and she heard there, there were good times back again in Bethlehem. Let's go back to my hometown. There was food there. And so they went back, and we know the story. It's, uh, Ruth, uh, her daughter-in-law, came with her, started working in the fields and barley harvest. She was a Gentile, not a Jew, working there. And she meets up with the owner of the field, Boaz. They start talking. It seems like they kind of like one another. Uh, she's a woman of noble character. Her reputation went before her because all that she did for her mother-in-law, Naomi, was all over the place. People had heard about it, how good she was, how she treated her. And here's this young gal out there working in the field, doing a kind of, well, humiliating job in the sense that she wasn't Jewish. She wasn't part of any family. She was a foreigner. I mean, the work itself certainly was honest work. But she would pick up the gleanings that were left for the poor. And... Uh, but we find this man, Boaz, who on the field, God was working in his heart and God was working in Ruth's heart. Boaz said to those who made bundles, sheaves of grain, he says, I want you to go to those sheaves of grain and pull out some intentionally and leave it in the field for this young woman to pick. Now see, the law never said that. That went far beyond the law. So that was an act of kindness and graciousness that was done for this young gal who might have felt alone as a foreigner but found that God's favor was upon her. Well, she had been doing this for a while. And as a matter of fact, he gave her a whole bunch of grain to bring back to Naomi. They were really blessed, had enough food for 10 days. Uh, so God blessed them. Well, now they were home in uh, chapter 3. Naomi says to Ruth, You know, my child, it is my responsibility to find a husband and a place of rest for you. She really felt obligated to do something for her daughter-in-law that treated her so well. She was going to be a yenta. She was going to be the traditional matchmaker, you might say. But this was a match made in heaven, though, truly because it went more than just a traditional Jewish yenta. Uh, God was planning, uh, planning in all of this, very much so. She wanted her to find a place of rest and contentment. She had worked so hard. She said, you've been working alongside the young woman who served Boaz. Is he not part of our family? Hey, this guy is related to us. Get it? Kinsman redeemer. Well, you know, she didn't get it, probably. Because these terms weren't familiar to her. The idea of a kinsman redeemer. I'm a mobile. What in the world does that mean? Well, she didn't understand it fully. He says, is he not a part of our family early this morning and during the late afternoon? He'll be on the threshing floor winnowing the barley. So she has a plan. Really, I believe it's God working in her heart, working out this plan. He says, now this man, Boaz, I'm going to tell you what he's going to be doing. She knew how it worked. She knew the season. She knew how the workers worked. She says, early this evening, during the late afternoon wind, and that's what they'll be doing. They'll be on the threshing floor winnowing the barley. You say, what in the world is winnowing? Well, they toss the stalks up into the wind with a fork and watch the grain fall to their feet 
as the stalks blow away. And that's how they separate the chaff from the wheat, the stalks from the wheat. So you might have a lot of fun doing that. You can imagine just grabbing a pile of it, throwing it up in the breeze, and there was a special place where they went the threshing floor east of the city, where there was a win, a good, usually a good win in the evening. So they'd throw it up in the air, and the grain would fall down, and the stalks would just fly away. And they'd have the grain, a whole pile before them. But now, I tell you, this woman, she really had a way about her. In verse 3, she says, bathe and perfume yourself. Put on your best dress, okay? I want you to look nice. Look nice, smell nice, take a bath, you know, everything, okay? Then go down to the threshing floor. Be careful, though. Be careful. Don't let him know you're there until he has finished eating and drinking. Once he's relaxed, he'll lie down. And make sure you notice where he is. Once he's lain down, go to him, uncover his feet, and lie down. And he will tell you what to do. Now, this had to be a little weird to her. Go down. Wait a minute. Okay, I get the part about you wanting me to find him and where he is, but you want me to go down and uncover his feet? And then he'll tell me what to do? You know, it doesn't say that in the text, but... Coming from a Moabite background, not having any of this, and this is in the law, she must have wondered, if not weird, this is very different. What does this mean? Well, first of all, the Hebrew euphorism there to uncover the feet really is a sexual expression. But in this context, and in the light of the honorable character of Boaz and Ruth, it is clear she simply was making herself available to marriage. In other words, by uncovering his feet, she was proposing to him, according to the Leverite custom. She wanted him for her husband. She wanted him to be the kinsman redeemer. We'll talk about that in a moment. So, so like I said, as a foreigner, the thought, this advice must have been kind of odd. But she followed the advice because she knew Naomi was a good, godly, trustworthy, moral woman. A woman of moral integrity. Her mother-in-law, so, you know, she figured she'd go along with it. Now, each of us knows a parent, an older friend, a relative who looks out for our best interest, don't we? We should be, in the like manner, willing to listen to good godly advice. People who have experience and knowledge, and certainly Naomi did. She knew what it was all about. She knew how to go about it. She followed the law. Uh, Ruth didn't have the foggiest idea what this was about, so she listened. Now, if you know the story of Ruth, can you imagine if Ruth did not listen to her mother-in-law, Naomi, how this would have turned out? Hmm, maybe a different ending completely, but she listened. You know, sometimes I think about that as God instructs me through his word, my heavenly father. And she was giving, by the way, Ruth advice from the Bible, you might say, based upon the law at that time. So you might say she was giving her biblical advice. Sometimes when I read the word and my heavenly father speaks to me and tells me what to do, sometimes it seems kind of odd. Sometimes it kind of ma doesn't make sense. Sometimes I'd say, well, God, I would prefer to do it this way, or I see it differently. But, you know, even though my ideas may not always line up with God's, God's way is always right. God's way is always true. And we can depend upon that. So this is what's unfolding in our story. So they have this neat little talk together. Neat little talk. And of course, we talked about the matchmaker and fiddler on the roof. But believe me, she was more than a matchmaker. She was actually following biblical guidelines, which says if your husband dies and you have no children, then his closest relative, brother or cousin, whatever, may marry you, and you may not lose the land that you have or the property you have. 
under his name. And that is so very true. Well, anyway, Ruth says in verse 5, I will do everything you have told me to do. I mean, what a, what a loving, trusting daughter-in-law. She could have said, Naomi, this doesn't make sense. I'm not too sure I want to do this. You know? But no. She says, all that you say, all that you told me to do, I will do. Wouldn't it, wouldn't it be wonderful that if we took the same attitude toward God as he instructs us in his word? Lord, all that you say, I will do. And sometimes we put up a little argument with him. Sometimes we want to debate with him a little bit. Sometimes maybe we want to tweak his instructions to us a little bit. You know, add a few additions. But no, she says, all that you have told me to do, I will do it. So she went down to the threshing floor and followed through with everything her mother-in-law told her to do. She did it all. Followed through. Pretty exciting. Not much later, Boaz finished eating and drinking and was in good spirits. He's feeling good. He made his way to the end of the pile of the grain, and he lay down there to sleep. So there he was, you know, I mean, he was contented. They had a good harvest. He was happy. He was in good spirits, you know. So he was now going to just take a nap. You know, it's, it's wonderful like that, you know, when you, you're, you're just contented. You're, you're full. You ate a good meal. Things are going well. You know, you're happy. You're rejoicing in the Lord. You're thankful. And you say, oh, man, I'm just going gonna, gonna to stretch out just have a, a good nap. Well, it was time to sleep anyway. So he made his way to the end of the pile of grain and lay down to sleep. Then very quietly, Ruth snuck to where he was lying down. She came in, you might say by stealth, you know, very quietly, followed Naomi's instructions to a T. This is the kind of gal you want to have doing something for you. You know, when you tell her to do something in an exact way, she's going to do it. She's going she's gonna to follow through. No alterations. So she snuck where he was lying down, and she uncovered his feet and lay down at his feet. Later sometime, perhaps in the middle of the night, guess what happens? Boaz was startled and woke up. Then he rolled over. The idea is the idea in the Hebrew there, he's twisted himself, rolled over, and looked around, and he discovered there was a woman lying at his feet. Now, just to make sure that there's no impropriety here, no sexual misconduct, she was lying at his feet. Okay? Okay. So get that picture in your mind. Nothing wrong here. And when he woke up in the middle of the night and saw this gal lying at his feet, and of course his feet were covered, he said, who are you? Now, that's the appropriate question to ask, right? Exactly. Wake up, see this girl lying at your feet, and you say, who are you? She said, I'm your servant, Ruth. But now, in accordance with instructions given to her, she uncovered his feet, and she said, spread your hem, the hem of your garment, so that it covers your servant. You are a near relative and family. You're our kinsman redeemer. It all clicked. He knew exactly what she was talking about. She was asking him for redemption. She was asking him to marry her. She was asking him to perform the right of a kinsman redeemer. He knew it well. He knew it all. Everything made sense at this point. No confusion about what was going on between them. Wow. And what did Boaz say? He says, May the Eternal bless you, my daughter, for the loyal love you're showing even greater than what you showed before. Now you showed great love to your mother-in-law. We heard about all the wonderful things you've done, and now you're showing even greater love. Considering a man my age, probably old enough to be her dad, you know, quite old, and uh, not ancient, but, uh, you know, probably uh, 40, in the 40s, maybe 50s, and she's probably in her early 20s. 
He says, you have not pursued a younger man. Hey, you could have went after a younger guy, but no. Or a rich one, or a poor one, but no, you chose me. He says, and then he told her he was going to take care of her. I mean, he was just so overwhelmed. Now, you can rest assured, if you've been with us, you know that Boaz has treated her very kindly. And perhaps has been thinking about this young woman in marriage already. Thoughts perhaps have been going on there. They hadn't been voiced. And you know, she's just doing more than following the law. Yes, she was following the law under the instructions of the Leverite, but she cared for him greatly. He showed her such kindness, and she has responded to that kindness. So it's more than just walking through the law here. It's two people who genuinely care about one another, and one offers himself in marriage to another. So he says to her, you may rest easy. Have nothing to fear, my child. I will do everything you ask. Everyone agrees in this city that you are a woman of virtuous character. Wow. How exciting. You are right that I am in line as a near relative of your family. He said, but I'm not the only one. You see, he was a godly man. He recognized, even though he was a close relative, he wasn't the closest one. That must have been hard for him to say that because he probably at that time was wishing he was the closest one because he knew another could marry her and not he. But being a good man, a godly man, even in the time of the judges where wickedness prevailed, he said, you know, I'm not the only one or nor the most likely. There's another man who is more closely related to you than I am. So, wow. Uh, now, how did this work with a kinsman, redeemer, and so on? Well, for instance, if a landowner needs to lease out his land for money, right? Then his closest relative, called a kinsman redeemer, is supposed to buy it back. So, I have land. I lease it out to money. You, so, you have my land that I've leased out for money. But if I don't have the money to buy it back, then my closest relative can do that, still keeping the land in my family. The same is true if he has to sell his family into indentured servitude as the kinsman redeemer to buy back the slave. So if my family goes into indentured service, someone from my family can buy us back. So the system reflects the relationship of God with Israel so they wouldn't have to do this with pagan nations. Now, since both Naomi and Ketzes closely, to understand what we're talking about here, since both Naomi and Ruth are widows without male sons, right? They are left in poverty. They are left in poverty. Naomi will have to lease out her husband's land to support them. That's how they're going to get support. She's going to have to lease out the land of her husband. And she may eventually have to sell herself in Ruth as indentured servants just to stay fed. Just to stay fed. So they were in rough shape. By redeeming Elimelech's land, marrying Ruth, if Boaz would do that, even giving her a son, Boaz keeps the family intact just like Elimelech was living, or either of the sons survived. So this is what was happening here now. It was making sure they could be together as a family, keeping the land, the blessing they had. So this is what it's all about. So she uncovers his feet, and he will cover her with his garment. But you notice, though they slept there at night, they had a pure relationship. They had a very pure relationship. And I think that's important uh, to realize that nothing happened that night that was unseemly. Look at verse 13. He says, spend the rest of the night here. In the morning, I will give, I will give him a chance. That is the closest relative to, to you. I'll give him a chance as your kinsman redeemer. 
and redeem you and your family. If he is willing to do this, good. He probably was saying, but my heart will be broken. But if he's not willing to fulfill the responsibility, as the Eternal One lives, as the God of Israel lives, I will redeem your family and marry you. Now remain here until the morning comes. We read that Ruth lay at his feet until early morning. You get that? Laid at his feet until early morning. Then she got up to leave while it was still dark before she could be recognized by anyone because Boaz realized no one should know that the woman was on the threshing floor. Okay. Ruth was a woman of purity. Boaz was a man of purity. It's a wonderful story. They both had a commitment to purity. And I think it's an example for any young guy and girl dating today or in a courtship situation. We should be committed to purity. No physical relationship before marriage. In an overall sense, it speaks about purity in all of our relationships as Christians. Not only in a sexual way, but purity in character, genuineness, godliness, wholesomeness about us. That kind of purity. And I tell you, Ruth and Boaz had it. They were of excellent character. Exactly. And they were examples for us. They did pursue their relationship. But they pursued that relationship in purity. Even the delicate situation of Ruth showing up in the middle of the night while Boaz is sleeping was not an impure act. You can see if this was a Hollywood movie, it would have ended differently, right? Exactly. But their relationship would reap strength of purity. If you really want to love someone, pursue purity with that person. If you haven't, start now. Start now. Ruth was a woman of excellent character. Matter of fact, I understand that Ruth comes right after the book of Proverbs in the Jewish Bible. And of course, Proverbs 31 talks about her being a noble woman, an excellent woman. She was that kind of woman. And Boaz, as found in chapter 2, verse 1, it says, a man of great wealth. Now that actually means in the Hebrew of great wealth, meaning he possessed the finest qualities. Boaz possessed the finest qualities. It's true he was wealthy, but he possessed the finest qualities of character. So here was a woman of excellent character and a man who possessed the finest godly qualities coming together and keeping pure. You say, oh man, what a cool story. That's it. That's what it should be like. They were committed to purity and both of them demonstrated excellent character. Have you ever thought about Christ as our kinsman redeemer? Have you ever thought about him that way? We have a kinsman redeemer in Christ. Though he was God, he came to earth as a man in order to save us, right? By his death, we celebrated this morning, by his death on the cross, what did he redeem us from? From sin and hopelessness. And Naomi and Ruth were in a hopeless situation unless a redeemer came along. You and I were in a hopeless situation until Christ, the Redeemer, came along and thereby purchased us for his own possession. Christ purchased us for his own possession. Boaz came and said, Now, Ruth, you belong to me. You're my wife. We're the bride of Christ. We're the bride of Christ. We've been purchased for his own possession. And what does this guarantee? This guarantees we don't lose that heavenly piece of real estate. This guarantees an eternal inheritance on our part. We have a place in heaven with our name written there, kept and reserved in heaven that will not fade away. Isn't that great? You see, 
That is what our kinsman redeemer came and did for us. He saw us in our hopeless condition as Boaz saw Ruth. He purchased us with his blood. We became his own. And now we have an inheritance that's secure. Wow. Look at verse 11. What did Boaz say to her? Do not fear. I will do for you all that you ask. Isn't that interesting? Ruth said to Naomi, I will do everything that you've told me to do. Boaz said to Ruth, I will do everything you ask. Don't fear. Isn't that great? You know, when we came to Christ, we say, Lord, I'm lost. I need someone to redeem me. I need someone to save me. We trust in him. Regarding salvation, Jesus said, I'll do all that you ask. Just trust me. Believe me. I'll be your redeemer. I'll get you out of the mess you're in. I'll be there for you. Wow. How amazing. But you know what? We talked about Boaz, right? He was more than willing to do this. He was dying to do this. However, there was a little bit of a glitch here. Oh, when the story was going so well, right? The glitch we talked about. There was this other guy who had first choice at her. Oh, well, the law is the law. I've got to follow the word of God. I've got to contact this guy. And that won't be till next week, by the way. I've got to contact this guy, and I've got to find out if he's going to take her away from me, if he's going to marry her. <sighs> Guess I have to do it. So there's a wrinkle here, right? Someone else is first in line, you know? You're about just to go up to the counter. No one's there, and someone jumps in front of you. Someone else is first in line. A little frustrating. Where do they come from? You know, but there's someone first in line here, and he knew it. Just when it looked like we were in for a happy ending, there was a snag. In the Hebrew system, the Leverite marriage, the closest relative had first choice or obligation. And Boaz could not proceed with wedding plans until the other guy is first given a choice. Now, I don't know if it was Boaz was praying, saying, Oh, Lord, please let him say no. He's not going to like her. I know he won't. You know, I don't know if he was doing that. It's not in the text, but we can throw ourselves in it. But the fact is, you can tell that he really wanted to marry her, but he also really wanted to please God. And sometimes doing God's will, we, we find it hard to meet conditions because God says, Do this and I'll bless you. And, but yet, Doing this would mean maybe he'd lose her. But you know what? He certainly would gain God's favor. Pleasing God meant more to him than marrying Ruth. Pleasing God meant more to him than marrying Ruth. Whenever two people are in courtship together, you say, you know what? Fella, you should love Jesus more than you love her. Gal, you should love Jesus more than you love him. When that's in place, then they have a right relationship. Then they have a, And this man loved God more than he loved Ruth. So what seemed to be a snag would work out. But you notice he says in verse 18 as we're reading down. First, let's back up a little bit. Fifteen, just before she was ready to leave that night, right? She got up when it was dark, when no one could recognize her. He said, hey, don't tell anyone you were at the threshing floor. They were gossip in those days too, right? Verse 15, he says, bring me the outer garment that you're wearing and hold it out and hold it tightly. So she gets her outer garment. She does that. And Boaz filled her garment with six measures of barley. She had a ton of it. He handed it to her, left and, and he, he left her, and he went to do his business. Okay, so he was eager to get this done. He was eager to find out what this guy was going to say. He was heading off to the city gates where they were going to meet and to get this done. I've got to know. I've got to know. I've got to get this settled, and I've got to find out what's going to happen. What's he going to say? So he left to conduct his business. Now, when Ruth returned to Naomi... Uh, 
to the home. Her mother-in-law asked her daughter what happened. And Ruth related to her all that Boaz had said and done. The whole thing. So far, everything was, you know, working out perfectly. At least she had done what her mother-in-law said right down to a T. But she also had to tell her about this other guy who had first choice. Okay. He even gave me six measures of barley, saying to me, you can't go back to your mother-in-law empty-handed. Isn't that great? He was thinking of uh, Naomi. He was thinking of Mara, who was once bitter. I think she's getting more sweet now. I think she's getting sweeter as the days go by. She's eating good. We know that. She's eating good. And she's probably praying, Lord, please make this work out for her sake. My daughter-in-law, she's been so kind to me. So, in verse 18, we read, Now you must wait, daughter. You must wait. We must wait and see what happens. Be at peace. This man will not rest today until this is resolved. Now, maybe she knew what kind of character Boaz had. But she says, Boaz will not rest today until he straightens this out, until he deals with it. He's going to follow it through. He's going to follow. He made a promise to, uh, to, to Ruth. Don't worry. I'm going to take care of this. And he would follow it through. He was a man of good character. He promised her. He obviously had a reputation for keeping his word. And he would not rest until this was completed. Now, we have such reliable people, really, in any age and any culture, right? Who, boy, I tell you, when they have something to do, when they give you their word, it's as good as done. They're going to do it. Boy, when you meet a person like that, you say, wow, that's what I like. You know, and they follow through. Do others look at us and regard us as people who do what we say? Boy, that's a question, isn't it? Keeping your word and following through should be high on anyone's party list. And I'll tell you, this guy Boaz was. He was building a reputation for integrity. However, it must be done one brick and one act at a time. So Boaz made a promise, don't worry, I'm going to handle this. I'm going to take care of this. And what a promise. See, verse 11, you may rest easy, he said. You have nothing to fear, my child. I will do everything you ask. So as we look at this, this couple, we see godly qualities in Boaz. We see excellent character in Ruth. So he headed into town early to settle the matter right. He would not let anything deter him. If anyone said, hey, come on, Boaz, let's have a cup of coffee together. Let's go to Duncan. No way. I've got business to do. I'm going down to the city gate. Oh, come on, you can do that. No way. Another time. Sorry. He would go straight down. Nothing to deter him. Naomi knew Boaz's character. He would not rest until he fulfilled it. What is that telling me? True love not only is pure, as we think about this whole proposal situation, true love not only is pure, but true love keeps his promises. True love keeps his promises. If you're in a relationship with someone and you find they promise you this, but keep on breaking their promises, boy, I'll tell you, that should really be a signal, right? If you're in a relationship with someone and they keep on promising and breaking their promises, that should be a signal. This is not the guy for me or this is not the girl for me. You know, but true love keeps promises. We see not only true love has purity and there was a pure relationship between them, but true love keeps their promises and they didn't hesitate to keep them. You can count on a person who really loves you to purity, to honesty, if they keep their promises. Now let's talk about for a moment the responsibility of a kinsman redeemer. I kind of explained it before, 
but maybe it wasn't clear. This included redeeming the family property that had changed ownership. And by now, it's reasonable to believe that just to live, they had to do this. They had to do this. Okay, so marrying a childless widow to raise up children and her dead husband's name. That's what you do. Now, you say, why didn't he marry Naomi? Why didn't he marry, why did he marry Ruth? He could have married Naomi. I mean, she lost her husband too, yes. He could have. He could have, but Naomi is probably, at this time, about 50 years old. She probably couldn't have kids. And the whole idea of marrying was to raise up children on, in the dead husband's name. To raise up children. Now, according to the law, as we said, the Leverite law, when there was no brother to raise up children in the name of the deceased, the responsibility was extended to the next of kin. Right? And we're seeing this. Boaz was one of them, but there was one a little closer. So Ruth's action was in accord with the law, which is required to take the initiative. Say, she went, she went to where Boaz was, she uncovered his feet, she was following what the law said, indicating that night her desire to have Boaz in marriage. And he gave every willingness and desire to perform it. But you know what? Besides that, there was a big plan here, right? And we know that Christ is our kinsman redeemer who came and saved us from the mess we we're in and gave us an inheritance we can't lose. But the big plan is for Boaz and Ruth. They would become the grandparents of King David. Remember? And King David, of course, is the line through which Jesus would come. And God would provide the great kinsman redeemer for the whole world. Jesus Christ, who would give his life that we could have an inheritance in him. You see, the big picture is, this is the big redemption story. Your redemption and my redemption. Your salvation and my salvation. Because you and I have met personally the kinsman redeemer. It's about to provide a redeemer for the entire world. So what have we talked about in this great chapter? We've said we know the character of God. Just like Ruth knew the character of Naomi. So we can follow through with his word, even though sometimes it may not line up with common sense, or might, may not line up with what we think, or even the way we would do it. Ruth did exactly what Naomi said. She followed biblical instruction. You and I need to do exactly what God says in his word and follow biblical instruction, even though at times it doesn't make sense. Even though at times we might say, God, I don't know, I know your word says this, but I think I'd do it a little differently. That's a bad way to go, bad way to go. We should always pursue purity in our relationships, being a wholesome Christian, right? Being a wholesome Christian. In our dress, the way we look, in our style, in our words, how important that is, and we see a purity and a wholesomeness between them. We should follow God's word for his blessings. Even though sometimes there are things in God's word, if we're going to be blessed, they're not easy to do. They're not easy to do. You know, walking in obedience is not always easy. But blessing is promised by walking in obedience. We know what happens when we do it our way. Oh, I tell you, it may be easy at first, but boy, your sin will find you out, doesn't it? It does catch up with us. We look at Boaz as a man who keeps his promises. Now, if Boaz is a man who keeps his promises, how about God? God always keeps his promises. It's been said, God has given a believer in his word 7,000 promises plus. You know, and God will keep every one of his promises. Boaz is a good man. He is a man of character. He kept his promises, but... How about God, our true kinsman redeemer in Christ? He always keeps his promises. So we can trust him. 
And finally, let's not forget, all of this wonderful story is a part of God's big plan for the true Redeemer of the world. Through David, eventually through the greater son of David, who was Jesus, who would come and redeem us, as we talked about this morning, the Lord's Supper, our kinsman redeemer. Dear friends, let's rejoice in these truths and let's walk in purity. Let's keep our promises. Let's be what God would have us to be and just rejoice in our salvation. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for your word, for this wonderful story. Lord, what an example that Ruth and Naomi and Boaz give us in godly character. And Lord, we can always start today. We can always start today. If I've messed up yesterday, if I've messed up in the past, I can always start today. You always give us a new page. You're so gracious. You're so wonderful. And we thank you for it. We thank you, Father, for the examples they give us in, in, in integrity, purity, and in carrying out their word. Father, help us to be like that. Help us to be people of excellent character, of wholesomeness, that bring glory to your name. Father, now I pray that we might take these truths to heart and just might not say, well, that was an interesting message, but thank you, Lord, for speaking to me. Thank you for bringing these truths home to me as a reminder, as an encouragement. I want to be that kind of a person. I want to be like Jesus, my true kinsman redeemer. We pray this in his name. Amen.